This is Bob. Bob is a Jesus follower. Bob knows that Jesus said to love his neighbor, but he isn't sure how. Everything he seems to try doesn't work. Even worse, sometimes he wonders if his kids and wife are feeling love from him. What is love? A series on loving others. Welcome, good morning. Hopefully some of you that are online right now, maybe you're getting on. Uh, we had catastrophic failures today. Um, our, our new plan on everything is recording the first service and our internet all went down at the end of service. And so when it should have like spun everything and sent it out for us, it didn't and it lost everything recorded in the first service and it hasn't come back yet on internet stuff so they're frantically working and there's lots of people that have been sending us text messages and everything saying why isn't it working and so they're they're trying to to get there um, or at least record something locally um, so we can put it back out later um, so i tell you what i'm going to do i'm going to pray uh, as we get ready to go and as they get started and then we'll come right back in so let me pray for us. Father, I thank you. And I thank you for people who are working so incredibly hard to share the message that we have today. They've, they've already heard it. That's why they're working so hard to, to get this out and to, to share it with some other people um, because God, it is, um, it's good. And I don't say that from, from a standpoint about me, but I say it from a standpoint about you. And this is all about who you are. So God, I, I do pray over um, this moment right now. I pray that you just use this as a reset. God, that you come into this space, that you, we would palpably feel and understand and know that you're here, that we would that we would taste your love in this moment. God, we just give you all of the glory and the honor in your name. Amen. Well, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. And he said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In another gospel, he says, what is the greatest commandment of all? Same sort of story going on here. And Jesus looks at him and he says, well, what do you know about what is written in the law? How do you read the law? And the lawyer answered back to him and he said that you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And then he said this, that in addition to that, you should love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus looked at the man and he said, you have answered correctly. And if you do this, you will live. But the man wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus one more question. He said, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? God, I know that we just talked to you a moment ago about being here in this moment, but I do pray over these words that we've just read that you would use them in a way to just fill us and to guide us and God, that you would get honor and glory from this moment. Pray all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, hi and welcome. I'm glad you guys are here. Start of a brand new series today. I'm calling this series, What is Love? I felt like that should like cue some music, right? Like, what is love? Oh, yeah. I, listen, I can't sing, so I'm not even going to try. But in this series, we're going to be looking at what the Bible has to say about love. What are we supposed to do with this idea, this word, love, and what um, are, are we going to do with it? You know, I, I love in this passage that we have a lawyer that's here, and he asks the question to Jesus. He says, Jesus, what do I have to do to gain eternal life? And in a different passage, we see same lawyer asking Jesus the same sort of question on stuff. And he says, hey, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment of all? Now, I, I don't know about you, but I've watched a lot of lawyering shows in my adult lifetime, right? And there's some things that I've learned about lawyering. I think I could be a pretty good lawyer after watching some of those shows. But one of the things that I learned about a lawyer is, is that you never ask a question 
that you don't already know the answer to. No surprises in the courtroom. So you always ask a question that you already know the answer to. And so when he asks this question of Jesus, hey, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Hey, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment of all? He already knows the answer. And Jesus, knowing that he's a lawyer, that he already knows the answer, says, well, I tell you what, why don't you tell me what you think is the greatest commandment? And he says, well, I, I think it's this. I think that, it's that you should love the Lord your God with everything that you have and that you should love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus looks at the guy and he says, yeah, that's right. Now, could you imagine that moment, right? Like you say something to Jesus and Jesus says, you got it. You understand what the right answer is. Like, I would be like, yeah, I did it. I nailed it. Like, I love whenever you ask somebody something and that like, you get the right answer or you knew the right answer. Like I was always that kid in class that um, whenever the teacher would ask, even if I didn't get the answer, I'd be like, I knew it. I knew the answer, right? You just want that sort of affirmation about stuff that you knew. It. And so here was the lawyer. Like I have to think that he felt pretty good about himself. And so he leaned in for one more question. And he says, Jesus who is my neighbor? Now, there's a lot of sermons. You can go Google or, or watch YouTube or any of those sorts of things, and you can find a lot of great sermons about who is my neighbor and about how Jesus answers that question. But you know what I find interesting? There's a question that the lawyer does not ask inside of this text. And you're all going, wait a second, what? Yeah, there's a question that he doesn't ask. And maybe he doesn't ask it because he already knows the answer to it. Or maybe he doesn't. And he doesn't say to Jesus, so Jesus, what does it mean to love? He doesn't ask him that. And maybe he would have gotten blown out of the water even more than the, the, the answer to the question about who is my neighbor if he had asked this question of what is love? How do I show love? What am I supposed to do to demonstrate love? What is love? Well, today I have a really big objective on everything. This series, we're going to be in it for the next six weeks. And today I just want to kind of set this series up, right? Kind of like an introduction, if you will, for the entire series. Now, some of you are out there thinking, yeah, that seems like a pretty easy thing to do. And it should be pretty easy, but I'm going to tell you, it's not going to be quite so easy as we take some twists and turns during the course of everything today. Because while I do know where this series is headed and what we're going to be doing, I think you'll get a sense of why it's not so cut and dried as we get going. Um, so I want you to just really hang with me, hang with me through all of this. As we get started, here's what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you to pull out a piece of paper, something to write with. If you're a phone person, whatever, open up the notes section in your phone, because I would like for you to write down. If you're watching online right now, if you're finally on with us online right now, if you found our stream somehow through the myriad of everything that's been going on. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong camera. This is the camera I was just looking at. Hey, if you found us, right, I want you to write it down too. You can just type it down in the, the comments down below on everything. What is love? If you were to define it, if you were defining what love is, how would you define what love is? This is that moment where I thought that we should use some great 80s music, right? Like Night at the Roxbury. I thought that'd be really right, right here. I beatboxing, that's as much as I got for you, right? <laughs> she was impressed. She had a look of impress, uh, impressed on her face right now. So I just, I just want you to know hidden talents of a pastor, um, <laughs> right? How would you define what love is? All right, I see some of you are thinking, some of you are writing it down right now. I'll give you just another moment or so uh, to think about that as you're writing. What is love? All right. I'm going to drop a couple different ideas. If this matches with whatever you came up with in your head or what it is that you wrote down, I want you to just 
show of hands on, on this, okay? If you're online watching right now, you can just uh, hit the like button. You can drop some hearts, some smiley face emojis, whatever it is that you like to click. You can just drop them on there. By the way, I like whenever I watch it back and you've like flooded the screen with those. So just hit like four or five times whenever it's you on, on everything. So here's the first one. Uh, did you define it this way? Something that would include romantic love. Right, something that includes a feeling. How many of you define love that way? Some sort of romantic, feeling, emotional sort of a thing. Oh, a couple of you, very good, okay. How many of you would define it this way? Um, love is an action. Love is an action, right? Oh, a couple more hands going up on that one. Um, in other words, love requires you to do something. How about this one? How many of you would say um, that love is unconditional uh, oh more hands on that one a couple of you voted twice on that one yeah very nice i like it she's like I, I did write it down it's right here pastor i promise i'm not lying about that yeah so in other words when i say unconditional it means that um, it's something that is given without any sort of expectation of something coming back in return right good you know i remember growing up and uh, I, I remember going with a, a group of friends to CC's Pizza. Anybody in here remember CC's Pizza? Oh, a few of you, yeah, there you go. All you can eat pizza buffet was great for 10 year old boys, right? And so I remember sitting there one day and we, we had some fresh pizza that came out, it was hot. I, I, honestly, I think it was like the Alfredo pizza, if you remember that, and you know, it was good. And so we were sitting there eating it and one of the boys exclaimed that was there in this group, he said, I love this pizza. And as only 10 year old boys can do, somebody piped up and said, then why don't you marry it? Yeah, exactly. If you love it so much, then why don't you marry it? Because we understood something. We understood that there was a difference between romantic love and this sort of objectified love that he was describing and talking about. And as 10 year old boys, we thought it was fun to make fun of that, right? I, I don't know if I've really grown out of it. That's where dad jokes come in now um, because, right, I think that's just the, the precursor to all things dad jokes. But we know something inherently about the word love, even as young as seven, eight, nine, ten years of age, and that is that love has a lot of different meanings, right? Love has so many different meanings in our language today. Now, you would think that our language would evolve over time, but I would like to um, submit to you evidence today, put on my lawyer hat again for a second, we talked about a lawyer, but I'd like to submit some evidence to you about why it is that our language has not evolved, but rather it has devolved, right? We now, we now send single letters to represent entire words, okay? Which is a shortened of okay, which is a shortened of O-K-A-Y, the original version of that. We can't even type two letters anymore. We're down to just one. Or I-D-K, right, for I don't know. Or O-N-G, oh my goodness. Oh, how many of you thought I was going to say something different? <laughs> yeah, sorry, Courtney. Not in my house. Not in your house either, I know. Very good. Oh my goodness. Or the other day I was on Facebook and this one showed up. G-Y-B-I-T-H-B-I-B-I-O-Y. And if you have kids, you probably can figure this one out. Get your booty in the house before I beat it off of you. <laughs> yeah, very good. You know, uh, it's not only that we've moved from single letters, but I would say we've actually taken letters out of this thing altogether. Right? And we've moved to these little pictures called emojis that we send all the time. I did not know that having a child in fifth grade meant that I needed a master's in Egyptian hieroglyphs in order to understand a text message from her, right? She sends to me these text messages that are all about her entire day, all in little pictures, emojis that are on there. Please send those on, on there right now, lots of emojis. <laughs> Um, yeah, but we, we've moved all the way down to not even needing a word or a letter to express an idea. 
So it's no wonder that when we come to this idea of love that has so many different meanings in our daily lives that we struggle with it. I mean love, right? It can be romantic love. It can be family sort of love. It can be like brotherly love or somebody that you feel like is a, a, a brother of, of who it is and what it is that you're doing. It can be love of an object. It can be love, some sort of emotional connection to an object, and we call that love. It, it can be the traits of something that we find desirable, and we'll say, yeah, I love that because I love the traits and the characteristics that exist in it. Um, and it's probably no wonder with all of these different sorts of meanings of the word love that that's been one of the most Googled questions of the last decade. What is love? Webster's Dictionary has defined it this way. It gives four different definitions. First, as a noun, it says it's an intense feeling of deep affection. It's a great interest or pleasure in something. As a verb, it says that you can feel deep affection for, as in like for someone, or you could like or enjoy something very much. Now I, I can begin to sort of see why all of that's confusing. I mean, here it is, this abstract word that we have so many different meanings for it. It can both be a noun and a verb. And we wonder why it is that we get all sorts of confused on this word about what it is that we're using and what it is towards and how and so on and so forth. But you know what's good is that um, as a church and as a Jesus follower, I actually don't, while well, Webster's Dictionary is good, I have something else that defines things for me. I have a Bible. So what in the world does a Bible tell me about this word love? All right, if you're hanging with me for, for all of that, if you're with me this far, say, I'm with you, Pastor. I'm with you, Pastor. Good. All right. Because here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw a curveball. I wish Gabby and Carlos were in the room because I've been watching Carlos throw some wicked stuff on Facebook. He's been pitching and, and pitching in the minors around here for us. And um, I, man, I've been watching him throw some, some really good stuff. So I'm about to throw a crazy, wicked curveball. Hang on. All right. Because the word love, the word love appears 310 times in the new, excuse me, in the King James version of the Bible. But in the New American Standard Version, it appears 348 times. But in, in the New International Version, it appears 551 times. And in the New Revised Standard Version, 538 times. Now, commonly, I teach from the ESV, and in that version, 684 times it shows up. And then, and then get this, the Bible that uses love the most time, the version that uses it the most is the New Living Translation, and it uses it a whopping 759 times. 759 times. Now, before we look at the disparity between those different translations, all right, I want to highlight one other thing. And so I've got another slide that I would like to put up in just a second. Um, not yet. Don't put it up just yet. All right. <laughs> I got ahead of myself uh, in the last service. But when we think about the Old Testament and the New Testament, typically what we think about is Old Testament, God who is angry and punishes people. New Testament, God of love. Right? And it sort of makes sense, right? Because in the Old Testament, that's where we find the story of Adam and Eve, and they get kicked out of the garden for messing up. We find the story of Noah and Noah's Ark, where God sends a flood, wipes out the entire world, only saves Noah and his family. That's it. And then a few chapters later, we find out that there's the Tower of Babel, and these people that were all speaking the same language at the time because there was just one language in the world had decided to build a tower up to try to reach the heavens and to be God. And so God says, no, listen, that's not how this works. And he strikes down the tower, and he takes and he scatters all of the people, and he scatters all of the languages. 
And then, and then we find a little bit later on that everything is still going so great in the world, right? That he has this challenge to Lot to see if he can find any righteous person inside of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And when he can't, he says, I'm putting down fire and brimstone and going to just eradicate the city. And he does, and Lot and his family leave, and he says, by the way, don't even turn around and look back at the whole thing. His wife turns, looks back, turns into a pillar of salt, dust, pff, gone. And then, and then we get to the next book, right? That's just the first book. The next book, in the first couple of chapters, we find that God brings down ten different plagues on Egypt. Well, no wonder we develop this picture of a God who is angry and always casting down all of these sorts of things. That's what it looks like as we read the Old Testament. And then we come to the New Testament and we're like, little baby. Everybody go, oh, Aww. right, babies. They just make us go, oh, they're like cuddly and we love babies. And so God sent Jesus as a baby and we go, oh, baby Jesus. And then we see Jesus grow up and we're like, he's loving and he's kind. And we see verses like this, John 3, 16, which says to us, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him would not die, would not perish, but would have eternal life. And then later on in the New Testament, we see 1 John 4, 8, which says this, God is love. You know, I love what R.C. Sproul says uh, about this verse. He says this. He says, love is such an intimate aspect or an intimate attribute of the character of God that any view of him that neglects to include within it this profound sense of divine love is actually a distortion of who God is. So let us never neglect to preach and to teach and rejoice in this lovely truth that God is love. R.C. Sproul was exactly right, but I want you to look back. I want you to look back, and I want to put the graph now up on the screen, because I want to show you the breakdown. Because in fact, in a few of those versions, there is actually more mentions of the word love in the Old Testament than there is in the New Testament. And the New Testament includes all of the love one another statements. Not the picture maybe some of you had about what the two testaments look like, right? I oh, I was blown away. Now, none of this is to say that we're supposed to highlight one attribute of God over any of the other attributes or characteristics of who God is, right? God is still just as just just as merciful, just as much grace as he is loving. In the same way that our sin, there isn't a difference in all of our sins. There isn't a difference in God between what his love and his wrath looks like. It's all in the same line. All right, let's go back. Let's tackle the glaring question, right? Pastor Charles, why was there such a huge disparity between those different versions, right? Why did one version, the King James, only have 310? Is it just a less loving version of the Bible, right? That other one, oh, that seemed like the one that talked about love a whole lot. I think I want to move to the New Living Translation. That's the kind of Bible for me. I want the love Bible, right? What, what is the difference between them? Is one of them better than the others? No. But I think it does highlight something for us. It highlights that these are all translations. They are a group of people who had to choose what is the best word to represent this word that comes from a different language into our language to help us to grasp what it was that the author is saying. And, you know, I mean, there's only like four, oh, wait, no, five, six, seven, Maybe as many as eight different words that mean love in the Greek language. And of course, in the Hebrew, there's only one. Well, actually, that two could be three. Four, I, I guess there could be five different words in the Hebrew language that could be the word love. I mean, we can't even keep straight how many words we think mean love. And so, and so you can begin to see why it is that those translators have such a, a, a difficult time for translating into this 
singular word that we have in the English of love that means all of these different sorts of things and how are they supposed to give us the sort of nuance that exists in everything with this one single word and we wonder why it is that we have this love problem right you know the king james version uh, not to pick on it but it made a choice just to give an example of a word that they translate as charity which is actually another word for love, but over 30 different times, they use the word charity instead of the word love as a part of everything. Last week, we saw a set of words in the uh, English Standard Version, right? That was perfect courtesy. And as we began to sort of unpack what that was, we realized that that was an idiom for what perfect love looks like and how it was that we were supposed to demonstrate love to others. And so it was this idea of that. Now. I told you that there are um, several Greek words and several Hebrew words. I'm going to put them all up on the screen. Um, the test is next week, so make sure that you write them all down. <laughs> Just teasing about that. No, no test um, uh, unless you're um, out of school. If you're out of school, then testing is definitely going to happen. Um, so each of these words that are in the Hebrew that, that are up there, um, those all of them come directly out of the Old Testament. We find them inside of Scripture at, at some point. Um, and some of them are incredibly interesting. The uh, most commonly used one is the word um, Ahab or Ahabe. Um, now, typically we'd look at it and we'd say, oh, that's Ahab. And his name, if you had the name of Ahab, would mean love or loving on everything. And so um, it, it's the most common. And as I was doing my research, I loved this uh this messianic rabbi who um, began to discuss this term and he said listen this term of uh, ahab comes from um, three different letters there's a root of it that are three hebrew letters and they are olive and they are hob and then they are bet i assume we're down again yep. It's okay. You guys are going to get some great preaching out of all of this. <laughs> all right? Give me one. I'm going to start and restart, and then it'll start a new live feed. Fantastic. So now it's the This one's still recording, though? That one's continuing. We'll put that one up. But Perfect. This, so you could just re-say hi real quick. Okay, good. <laughs> hi. Welcome back. <laughs> all right. So you have these, the, these, three, um, these three letters, Olive, Hay, and Bet. And um, together they make up the, the word of Ahab. And the, the middle one, uh, the, the middle root of, of hav and bet, uh, together, they're the word give. So this word of, of ahab or ahav, as part of its root inside of it, means to give. Now what's interesting, and this Messianic rabbi helps to highlight inside of uh, his context of everything, is he says, listen, there's another Hebrew word for give, and it is the word natan. And it is spelled none to none. Uh, that, that's literally how you spell it. And it's read the same frontwards and backwards. And he said there's an intentionality behind that because giving is both giving and receiving. It's a circular sort of a thing on everything that it does. And so as much as you are giving out will be what is coming back to you. That's part of the concept of the word. And it's the root of this word to love in the Old Testament. Same rabbi describes um, this other con uh, concept of the word Chabad. And, and he says this. He says, love is not something that simply happens to us. Instead, it is something that we create through our actions when we give of ourselves to others. You see, we have no control over the other. So love does not begin with the other person. Instead, it begins with us within ourselves. There's a story of a young boy who once asked his rabbi, he said, Rabbi, would you tell me why it is that man is created with two eyes? And the rabbi said, uh, absolutely. So he said, with your left eye, you're supposed to look at the inside of yourself and investigate everything that is inside of you so that you can be better uh, as you move forward. But he said, with your right eye, he said, you should be looking at others with loving kindness and looking and searching for the best qualities that are in them. You see, if we truly want to be loving, 
the first thing we need to do is to examine ourselves to determine where it is that we can make improvements. Here's the last Hebrew word that shows up, and it's arguably the most significant word for love in the Old Testament, the word hasid. It's translated most often as the, the word loving kindness, but there's actually not any sort of Greek or English equivalency to this word. It has this idea of like fidelity and loyalty and patience and mercy and grace and forgiveness all wrapped up in one. It's covenantal faithfulness and it's salvation. In all ways, this concept is tied up and connected with God. Now, unlike those Hebrew words that we showed up there, they all come from the Old Testament. Not all of the Greek words that we know that speak of and talk of love show up in the New Testament. Now, it's not to say that there aren't all of them in concepts, right? We can find concepts of each of them. In fact, one of them, uh, philatua, all right? It's, if you say it really fast, you might sound like flatulence, but don't say it like that, all right? Um, right? But if you say it, that word right there, it's a love of self. And the passage that we looked at, right, where the lawyer was saying, listen, you should love your neighbor as yourself. While he doesn't use this word, very clearly would have been using this sort of concept of self-love. Now, in, in recent years, especially here in our culture, we have taken on this idea that too much self-love is a bad thing. And I'm not going to argue one way or the other on, on that particular sort of idea, but I want you to understand culturally that self-love was healthy for them. And so when he's saying that you should love your neighbor as yourself, he's saying, listen, it's healthy for you to love yourself, to respect your own body, to respect your person, and to take care of who it is that you are. And so, as a result, what is also healthy is that you love somebody else and that you love them with the same sort of respect that you give to yourself because that's honoring to you and to them. Now, there are four of those Greek words that do show up in the New Testament. Here's the first one. Now, this one is a word that many of you will know already you'll hear the word and you'll and you'll hear the equivalency of it and you'll go oh and he talked about that word hang on the word is eros right or sometimes you might hear it eros on stuff right this is the word for romantic love and our english equivalence of this is the word and it sits inside of it is erotic right erotic sort of a love it's passionate it's emotional right and sometimes the greek language would have this sort of word picture of like a wildfire burning out of control in fact the times and places where it's um, mentioned inside of um, the new testament while not directly mentioned it talks about that we need to put up the right sort of containers and barriers around this to protect against something that can create and cause so much damage We can see it uh, cited in, in places like 1 Corinthians 7, verses 8 and 9. We see it mentioned inside of the Old Testament book, the Song of Solomon. Um, if you're married, right, those are the only people who can read that book. Um, if you're not married um, or, you know, Alberto, don't go read this book at home, <laughs> all right? It, it's not fit for young eyes. Um, if you're newly married or um, still of childbearing age, go home and read this together. We'll have a child boom, all right? It's great. It'll make you blush together. Uh, it's a great book, um, but it only is fit for marriage conferences, okay? Just so that we all are clear on that. Another Greek word that's used, storge, um, right? It means familiar or familial love. Right? It's generally used in some sort of like a family context. Now, just like the word eros doesn't show up directly inside of the New Testament, this word doesn't show up directly. Um, actually, it shows up in what we would call the negative form. It has an A in front of it, a-storgos. 
And the awe negates what it is. It puts it into a negative conjugation of everything. Uh, In other words, it would mean not loving. And we find it in Romans 1.31 and again in 2 Timothy. And in both of those those two places, astorgos is translated as heartless. Heartless. Then there's another word for love that um, shows up rather frequently inside of the New Testament. It's the word um, phileia or phileo, right? It's a friendship, an intimate, an authentic sort of a love. Now, this is that love that guys try to avoid when they're more into an eros sort of situation with a girl. They don't want to be in the friend zone, right? They're trying to move out of that. Actually, it's more than just that, though. My loved one author describes this as it was like a soul to a soul sort of a bond on everything. Um, It's often even referred to as like brotherly love. In fact, it shows up inside of our culture still today. We talk about the city of brotherly love or Philadelphia, which is what that same word, philea, right? It's right there at the very beginning, and it's the word for love and that kind of love. You know, my favorite example of this word comes um, after uh, a man named Lazarus has died. Lazarus was a, a great friend of Jesus, and let me just set the story up for just a second. Jesus was hanging out, and he was near where Lazarus and his family were, um, and the Jewish officials all came after him, and they were ready to put Jesus to death. And Jesus said, listen, it's not time. And so Jesus um, left, and he went back to around the Sea of Galilee and, and to where the ten cities, the Decapolis was, and was doing ministry all in that sort of area far away from where all the Jewish authorities were and sort of where they didn't have um, nearly as much ability to come after him and to kill him. And so word comes to Jesus as he's in this area teaching, ministering, doing stuff. And they say, listen, your friend Lazarus is very, very sick. In fact, he's, he's on death's doorstep. And Jesus says, okay, thank you very much. And he doesn't leave. And the disciples sort of had to wrestle with this. They're like, well, what's going on? And so for days, Jesus continues to just do ministry in this area. And they've come to the conclusion, well, we're just not going. Because it's too dangerous for Jesus to go back. If he goes back, they're going to kill him. And Jesus knows and understands that. So we're just going to stay here. We're going to stay safe. And after several days go by, Jesus says, okay, let's go. Uh, Time out, Jesus. Why are we going now? I don't really get it. I don't really understand what's about to happen on all of this. But they go. And when they get there and they're just outside of Lazarus' house, the family comes out to meet him. And there's great tears and sadness and wailing because Lazarus has died. In fact, he's been dead for four days. And the family's like, Jesus, if you had just been here, you could have healed him. You could have taken care of him. Everything would have been okay. And then Jesus went to where Lazarus was in the tomb. And I love what John eleven thirty five 35 says. It's the shortest verse in the entire Bible, but I connect and resonate with it. It's a great verse to refer back to whenever you lose a loved one. I want you to see what it is that the Bible says happened right here. Jesus wept. He cried. And I want you to read on with me about what happens next says that the jews in other words they had brought some professional mourners people that were there kind of like funeral directors if you will and some others around the side they looked and they said see how he loved him and the word love right there is the word phileo they saying look look at how affectionate look at that brotherly look at that family look at that deep connection that he had with him so much so that it caused him to weep over his death jesus didn't just like drip a little tear he was broken over this moment where his good friend had just died what's amazing is jesus knows what's about to happen and he's still broken like this in that moment and so jesus then says to them hey listen will you roll away the stone that's over the tomb and they're like 
Jesus, do you know what's about to happen when we do that? He's like, yeah. And they use some good King James version right there. He stinketh, <laughs> right? They say, listen, he's been in there four days at this point. And Jesus says, I know, roll it away. And he shouts out the name, Lazarus, come out. And he does. Jesus brings Lazarus back from the dead. You could hear a pin drop in this place off of that. Jesus had a close and personal friendship with Lazarus. It was a phileo sort of a love. And then finally, there's this fourth word in the Greek. It's the word agape or agapao in the verb. And it means like a selfless sort of a love, an unconditional love. It's a, a love of choice. I love what Precept Ministries said. They defined this as the highest form of love. And while it was the least commonly used form in all of classical Greek, in other words, you could gather all the other writings that we could find from around the time that Jesus was alive. And very, very few times will you find this word agape or agapao. But over 50% of the uses in the New Testament of the word love are this word agapao or agape. Like this one, when Paul wrote in Romans 5.8, but God demonstrated his love for us. God demonstrated his selfless, unconditional love of choice for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's the word love right there is agapao. It's the same one that when Jesus and when the lawyer made the statement of love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, both of those were the word agape. Now these last two words, phileo and agape, are, are used in this wonderful discussion between Jesus and Peter. And again, let me just set up what's happened. Jesus has died and he's resurrected and come back to life. The uh, disciples have all seen him in the upper room and Jesus has gone out and he's meeting with other people. Right? The book of Acts tells us that nearly 500 people encounter Jesus after he comes back from the dead. And the disciples aren't really sure what they're supposed to do with their lives. And so they just go back to life like it was kind of before Jesus. And they're out on the boat. And they're fishing because that was how they made money. They were, that was their livelihood. And they fished all night long. And there were no fish in the boat. They weren't catching anything. And all of a sudden, this guy standing on the beach says to him, says, Hey, um, how's the fish? How's the, how's the fishing going? And they're like, it's not. He's like, yeah, well, have you tried the other side of the boat? I mean, it's like the guy on the beach didn't even understand how the thing works, right? You see, the boat floats on top. The little fishies swim underneath both sides, forwards and backwards, diagonal, all around, net on this side. Guys on the boat said, <laughs> humor him. Let's just throw it on the other side. So they take and they throw the net on the other side. And instantaneously, the net is so full, they can't even drag it up and into the boat. It's like pulling water into the boat. They know who it is that's on the shore. In fact, Peter, who was on the boat, jumps off of the boat and begins to swim in to go see Jesus, who's on the shore this moment where then the disciples all come in and they begin to have breakfast on the beach with Jesus so great in the middle of the conversation we see it play out and Peter and Jesus have this this moment and Jesus looks at Peter and he says hey Peter do you love me and Peter says yeah Jesus I love you and he says great tend to my sheep and a little bit later on he says hey Peter do you love me and 
Peter says, yeah, Jesus, I, I love you. And he says, great, tend to, tend to my sheep. And then he says to him again, he says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And this time with, with tears coming down his face and brokenness happening, Peter says to him, yeah, Jesus, I love you. And he says, great, take care of my flock. And we look at this and read this in the English. We go, oh my goodness, what's going on? I don't even really understand why Peter is broken on all of this. And we sort of begin to start trying to make stuff up. Some of them are really good, like the fact that there were three times that this happened and three times that Peter denied Jesus whenever he was headed to the cross. And we know that this was some sort of restoration moment for Peter that was going on. But when we see it in the Greek, we see that there's a couple different words for love that are going. It's not the same word. You see, Jesus says to Peter, hey, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally with no restraints, with this selfless sort of a thing? Do you love me like that? And Peter says, I phileo you. I have a deep affection for you, but I don't know that I'm quite at your level on all of this sort of stuff. Jesus says, okay, take care of my family for me then. Take care of those that follow me. I'm the shepherd. I'm the great shepherd. Take care of all of those who come after. Hey, Peter, yeah, Jesus, do you agape me? No, Jesus, I, I can only say I phileo you. It's all I can say. I'm just not there. I didn't measure up when I had the moment to demonstrate that it was selfless. I could have been on the cross with you. I could have been dying next to you. I could have been proclaiming that you were innocent. I could have been proclaiming that you were the Son of God, that you were the Messiah, that you were all of that, and I didn't. I phileo you. okay take care of my little lambs the little ones that come hey peter yeah jesus do you phileo me yeah jesus i do that's all i can tell you i can do right now i love that Jesus still said, here's the bar, but I'm going to come down and meet you right where you are. And I'm going to tell you that it's okay, and I'm going to help you get there. So, what is love? Right? What does God mean when he says love when he says to love god when it says to love our neighbor when it says to love our spouse are are all of those things the same thing are are we supposed to be doing something different how am i supposed to be doing these things uh, am i supposed to do all of that and to all of that i say welcome to the series that's what we're going to be talking about for the next five more weeks right Thank you. I appreciate that. There's the setup on all of it. Because that's what we're going to be talking about. That's what we're going to be looking at. That's what we're going to be unpacking. But if there's anything that I want you to walk away with today, I want you to understand that God is love. He's all of these things that we just talked about. Because he's the originator of them all. It starts with him. God is love. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this moment that we get to just lean in and talk about what love is and what it means in our lives and how we apply the things that are going on. And Jesus, I'm so glad that you meet me right where I'm at. But at the same token, you don't move the bar. It's still set there. But you said you're going to help me get there. Jesus, use the next several weeks to help me get there, to challenge me to change. It's in your name I pray.